<laughs> Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed lunch. And uh, I now am going to introduce Leo Coleman, who will be uh, moderating our second panel for today. Leo is assistant professor, soon to be associate professor, in comparative studies here at Ohio State. His research areas include political anthropology, especially in South Asia, technology and globalization, and food studies. In 2011, Leo edited a collection of essays titled Food Ethnographic Encounters, which include, includes writings reflecting on what we learn about people when we share their food and conditions of life. Leo is currently completing a book about the politics of electrification and urban change in Delhi. And Leo will be moderating our second panel, Theories and Criticisms of Contemporary Food Systems. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, KB, for the opportunity to participate in this seminar and for all of the, uh, thank you to all of the other people who contributed to organizing it. It's been a really uh, great pleasure to work with you. I'm very honored to be able to moderate this panel, the second panel of our second day, um, featuring three distinguished panelists who I'll introduce um, as they uh, stand up to speak. Um, I can't promise anything, but I think, I suspect, that our discussion in this panel will be somewhat of a change of pace and scale from the, uh, the previous panel, not to imply that there wasn't theory and criticism this morning. There was a lot of both. Um, but we have brought together uh, scholars for this panel who specialize in theorizing the imminent and emergent effects of large-scale systems, um, but always with good concrete examples, ethnographic, historical, cultural, uh, and I believe that this will be a productive adjunct to the conversation we started this morning. So our first panelist is Jason Rees, who uh, comes to us from OSU's own Kirwan Center of Race and Ethnicity. He is a regional planner and a researcher there. Uh, and I'll just turn it over to him. Good afternoon, everyone. It's quiet out there. <laughs> Please yell out to me if you can't hear me. I've been battling with the ailment for a while, so my voice is a little, a little scratchy from time to time. Uh, my talk today speaks to the social aspects of urban agriculture. Uh, the theme of this panel really is a critique of contemporary food systems, and you know we could spend the entire 90 minutes critiquing just you know there are so many different aspects of uh, how the primary food system that most Americans uh, work within or, or how they access food nowadays. Uh, but I actually wanted to have a more focused discussion around urban agriculture in particular. And I want to uh, kind of present a critique of urban ag that kind of comes from a community development perspective, but also from a critical race or a structural racism perspective. I want to preface this, though, by saying that you know, I'm not opposed to urban agriculture. And in fact, I've seen very catalytic urban agriculture projects that have worked in neighborhoods and really fostered revitalization. Um, I do think it's a, it's a really great and wonderful solution in certain contexts, in certain neighborhoods. But I really want to get into some of the complexities around imposing urban agriculture into traditionally marginalized communities. Um, and note that these complexities are really not just a nuisance or a barrier to kind of moving forward with this vision of kind of thinking about a larger scale of urban agriculture in the U.S., um, but they're actually very important, and they take a lot of nuance to understand, and they take a more proactive approach that I'm going to suggest today is really based around community engagement to fully um, engage with and resolve and hopefully work more proactively with communities to see urban ag as a solution um, which is more sustainable and has a more transformational impact in people's lives and in the communities in which we're proposing to put these projects in. So I have really kind of two issues I want to reflect upon today uh, which kind of get captured in these two quotes here. So excuse me for paraphrasing, but um, the first article from Grist here really notes that post-recession, 
we have communities across the country that are trying to deal with this very difficult problem of vacant land, areas of extreme disinvestment, um, and really thinking about how do we re-envision places that have lost um, substantial aspects of their population um, and where vacant property and vacant land or blighted land is as prevalent as functional land uses in those places. And also note there are very good reasons that communities are embracing this. Um, one is that urban agriculture in particular kind of can appear as a real panacea that can deal with all of these ills that we find in traditionally uh, divested urban communities of color or communities that have been marginalized for some time from providing fresh access to food, really helping support health equity, reuse of vacant land, removing blight, community development, providing functional productive green space and all the benefits that we know come along with that. But there's a second piece to the story in that for as many plans as I've seen urban, urban agriculture included within, or as I've noted recently, lots of urban redevelopment plans where it almost appears as if all the spaces that we don't know what to do with, we just shade green and say this would be a great urban farm. Um, there, it really hasn't caught fire like we would expect it to given the scale of writing about it, the energy and the enthusiasm around it. And I want to just talk about some very pragmatic issues that I think from a community development standpoint we have to think about and come to some conclusion on if urban agriculture is going to expand. The second piece that I want to get into and we'll probably spend more time on my talk today on is really coming back to a point made by Mike Ham earlier today when he was talking about large scale, excuse me, large scale urban agriculture in Detroit. Now Detroit is a place that, you know, from a landscape perspective, given the decades of disinvestment in Detroit and depopulation, probably is one of the most suitable cities in America for considering this as a long-term solution. Um, but it was noted in that earlier presentation that you know, when you do focus groups with folks in Detroit, that there isn't real clear consensus that that's the vision that the remaining 700,000 Detroiters still want to see for their city. And so I really want to kind of get into this apprehension. And in prepping for this talk, I spent a little bit of time just reviewing lots of manuals, kind of how-to practice pieces, stuff produced by nonprofits, by various extension offices, um, some public health agencies on how do we kind of, you know, kind of create our own, own urban farming projects, how do we get started with those. And I was really taking a, a particular view of what about this issue of community apprehension or resistance? What direction is be, being given to folks who are advocating this approach in terms of dealing with that? And the majority of the time, uh, you know, I would say almost exclusively, the approach, kind of, and I'm going to paraphrase here, was always seen as if you run into community resistance, community education is the answer. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that it's a lot more than just education. And in fact, education and education alone is not the answer. It's not even the appropriate answer when there are kind of more deep-seated community reservations about these projects. And in fact, a more kind of robust engagement process is actually what you should be thinking about if you want to build the critical mass of community support to actually make these projects sustainable in the long term. So just to get into a few of the more pragmatic uh, issues here, um, the first being scale, which we had some discussion on earlier today. And while there have been lots of studies on large-scale urban ag, um, and there have been some projects, we really haven't seen this tested in the real laboratory of a functioning city. Um, so we really don't know what the impact of this is going to be or some of the more pragmatic implementation issues that we're going to run into. Um, so I'm going to kind of contrast these two scale issues here. Uh, most of the projects that we see in many urban areas are small scale, a couple of vacant lots, um, generally kind of um, staffed by volunteers, probably foundation funded, 
or some kind of nonprofit or maybe public sector support, um, but that's probably seed funding, not necessarily sustainable funding. Um, generally not profitable, if profitability is a goal for sustainability of the project. Um, and you don't really see a lot of those economies of scale that we talked about earlier. On the flip side of that, as we kind of think about the possibility of larger scale urban ag projects, those also come with their own kind of side effects that we have to think through. First is just the impact on the urban fabric. You know, there, there's a reason why cities function the way they do. And if our long-term strategy for these urban places is to actually decrease the density of those cities, um, a lot of the other environmental benefits of that space potentially acting as a city, having that dense infrastructure that's so important to be a functional city, starts to wither away. And so we have to actually think about that. Are our urban spaces going to become semi-urban, semi-rural places? And is that what we really want to see in some of these cities? The other piece of this is that land, even in a completely divested place, often equals power. And I'll give a little anecdote here from uh, some of my earlier work with the Institute. Uh, and we are an applied research center, or an engaged research center as we sometimes refer to it. So I've worked in about uh, two dozen states across the country over the past decade, uh, primarily with folks in the nonprofit sector, a lot of community organizers around issues of community development, um, housing development, um, neighborhood revitalization. One of my earlier experiences with the, was at the Institute was working with community organizers in Detroit, uh, a faith-based organizing collective known as Moses, in trying to get the first land bank policies enacted in the city of Detroit. And those not familiar with land banks, land banks are the kind of hyper-efficient public sector entities that can really help us deal with all the administrative and bureaucratic hassles of vacant land in terms of getting ownership straightened out to moving it into productive uh, reutilization again. And if you know kind of the history of what happened in Detroit, in 2003, the Michigan State Legislature passed the Detroit, excuse me, the Land Bank Fast Track Act, which was really to kind of speed up the process of land banking in Michigan. Uh, somewhat built off of the model in Genesee County in Flint, Michigan, which has been kind of a national darling of thinking about how to really do vacant land redevelopment well. And most folks thought this would be a really easy issue. Detroit has probably the most uh, you know, challenging vacant property uh, issue in the country. But it took years for Detroit to pass its own city land bank, and in fact, Wayne County passed and enacted its land bank prior to the city of Detroit. And if you would ask me why that happened, I can tell you as kind of my experiences of an insider working with community organizers who was pushing this policy solution was that there was an internal fight between city council and then mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, now currently incarcerated mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, <laughs> you know a little bit about Detroit. And the reason that there was a conflict was that as devastated as Detroit was, and as how many of us would view this land as not valuable to those politicians, that land was power. And who held the keys to the land bank held power in that city. And so it's just really important to note that even land that we may drive by and think really has no value anymore, in fact, symbolically and in practical terms, can actually connotate a lot of power, especially when it's accumulated at scale. The other pragmatic issue I really want to get into here is that you know, I'm using Detroit as an example because it is one of the more devastated cities in our country, but one of the challenges that those of us who work around dealing with vacant properties uh, have to kind of encounter is that most of our neighborhoods that have seen disinvestment are not a blank canvas. It's more like the kind of broken tooth, gap tooth smile of a, a beaten up hockey player if you think about the landscape, right? So functional house, vacant house, occupied house, house that's been burned out, another property next door that might be utilized, maybe people are squatting in it. Um, it's not the case where we can usually go into urban areas and just see acre upon acre of continuous, excuse me, contiguous vacant land. The other thing to note that the, the biggest increase in vacancy that's happened in a lot of these neighborhoods is really the 
from the result of the housing crisis. And just as was noted earlier, most of those structures are still standing. And so we have to make a decision about which one of those shall be salvaged and what we're going to do with the ones that do not get salvaged and how we actually um, remediate those areas. The other piece I really want to throw in here is just a practical kind of resource challenge that I want to throw out as a real issue that we have to think about if we're going to take urban agriculture to scale. There really isn't a tremendous surplus of funding for urban redevelopment right now, especially redevelopment of vacant property. And while there are certain federal programs that have provided investment streams, um, when you look at the scale of money coming in, especially at the federal level, to the scale of the problem that we're dealing with, um, we have to be really strategic with those funds that come in. So we basically had, really, I'm going to identify three national programs that have directed large-scale funding into cities to deal with vacancy and vacant land. Neighborhood <coughs> Stabilization Program um, Part 1, Part 2, which was just an extension of the first phase of the program, and the settlement, which came out of the banking uh, negotiations with the federal lawsuit filed on behalf of state AGs across the country with the large banks. Um, to deal with um, issues in regards to banking practices that contributed to the foreclosure crisis. So that's a, a good sum of money, and that's actually funding some really good work, but we do have to put it in scale. And I'd like to point out that NSP1, which was probably one of the biggest chunks of funds coming in early on, about $4 billion from NSP1 got disseminated to cities across the country via HUD. This came at the tail end of the Bush administration, was reenacted as part of the stimulus program in the early days of the Obama administration as NSP2, has a finite ability that, although there's $4 billion, there's a finite ability for this program to actually impact lots of land in our cities. And I like to use Cleveland as an example because, you know, $4 billion sounds like a lot, but once you start to carve out the chunks of money that go to the states, that go to all the different individual entitlement communities, um, you know, cities in terms of what they were actually receiving was more on the scale of about 15 to maybe $30 million, which again seems like a lot of money. But once you start to factor in how much vacant property you're dealing with, the costs of remediating all of that land, it gets more complicated. So for example, Cleveland took one of the more aggressive approaches with its NSP funding, really hyper-focusing on demolition, which really probably from a policy standpoint was the right way to go. So their NSP funding part one, they were able to demo, I think, around 12 or 1,300 properties, which is impressive. But I want to put it in the context of the foreclosure crisis that was impacting Cleveland at that time. At that time, which was at the height of the housing crisis, Cuyahoga County was losing 14,000 properties a year to foreclosure. So I want to note you know, that we have serious funding issues, and we have to be very strategic about those funds. And to note if, if urban ag is going to become a land use that we're really going to invest in as the solution to a lot of these neighborhoods, um, it's going to have to be done in the context of, a lot, of what a lot of other community development practitioners have to deal with in terms of securing funding to have a big and more transformational impact. The other issue I do want to note here too is that similar to what we see in more kind of grassroots community development, um, these smaller scale urban ag projects have to deal with the same challenge of um, simultaneously benefiting from the kind of power of a lot of volunteer organizational support, but also being limited by that volunteer organizational support. And a lot of that has to come down to financial sustainability. One of the biggest challenges in community development is to move a community organization from an all-volunteer base to an organization that actually has staffing, permanent professional capacity, and therefore is more sustainable. It can actually carry policy uh, for the long term. It can actually implement more complex projects. And from just a community development standpoint, these are the types of organizations that have a longer term impact. And so these projects, these smaller scale urban ag projects, are going to deal with the same issue because, as a lot of writers have noted, 
they are still on that treadmill of relying on either foundation funding to meet some of their costs and really relying on organizational um, support from volunteers. And as to be noted too, you also have what I refer to as the champion effect. And what I'm going to speak to here is that you can have a program that's, or, or an initiative that's wildly successful, but it's actually the determination of kind of an exceptional person with that program that drives it to success. It's not necessarily the program itself. And so once that person leaves, the program really then starts to lose some of its effectiveness. And so it's, you know, this is particularly a problem when you're doing initiatives that are volunteer-based because you're more likely to lose that powerful champion at some point. Second issue I want to get into today speaks more to this issue of understanding community apprehension. Excuse me, I take a drink. Well. So I will start this with a story. I was um, meeting with a young Sierra Club worker who was doing organizing in inner city areas around climate change. And this organizer was so frustrated because this organizer had been going door to door throughout the neighborhood. And as the organizer kind of relayed to me, no matter what I do, I can't, and this is what I'm going to quote here, I can't get these people to care about climate change. And my response to that was, well, you have to understand that you're working in impoverished communities where the day-to-day -day challenges of living in that community are taking up the primary mental space of folks living in that neighborhood. So if you're worried about getting evicted the next month, or you're worried about your kid getting victimized by gang violence, or you're worried about finding your next meal, it is really hard to kind of divert your energy toward these more kind of abstract, long-term environmental goals. And this, I want to go back to this notion of education as the solution to this. Because you know, the, the simple answer to that is, well, you just need to educate those folks about what a problem climate change is, how it could impact their life in the long term, et cetera, et cetera. And what I want to say is that actually that's not the solution if you want to engage those folks and get them invested in the work that you're interested in doing and doing and the work that's going on in the community. And in fact, listening to those folks and proactively engaging them and understanding their challenges and how their challenges may relate to these bigger picture issues may be the way to go. I'm pulling two quotes here. This is from a recent article kind of talking about some backlash there in St. Louis over a, a larger project there in St. Louis. Um, and just a community member's reaction to that when she noted that no one asked us, no one told us this was coming, and it isn't happening next to where they live. So I want to contextualize that a little more. And to do that, I want to bring in this concept of structural racism. So with the long um, Aspen Institute definition here, structural racism. Um, and what I want to note about structural racism is what structural racism presents and why it's a lens of analysis that can help us when we think about complex social problems is that structural racism acknowledges that throughout our society's history, and even in contemporary times, we have complex structural arrangements that allocate advantage and disadvantage to different communities. And that is the day-to-day -day lived experience for a lot of folks. And also from the perspective of thinking about this complex issue of advantage or disadvantage or privilege and not being privileged, for those folks who are living in communities that deal with the most ongoing disadvantage, where um, they have a long history of inequity or inequality impacting those communities, they have a very different perspective on how the world works. And I'm going to um, be the only speaker that quotes the uh, matrix today, so forgive me for a second here. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, the uh, So Tim Wise, who is a, a writer on structural racism, a really phenomenal writer, OSU brought him here for the Diversity and Inclusion Conference last year, phenomenal speaker. Um, he has this really great matrix uh, example to talk about this notion of privilege. And he likes to put it in the context of the red and the blue pill from the matrix. And it, just to refresh you on the memory of this movie, right, 
So if you go in and you take the blue pill, which Neo has a choice to do, you get to live in this kind of blissful world where um, you know, everything kind of goes your way. All the harsh realities of your existence aren't really visible. Um, but if you take the red pill, all of that stuff becomes visible, right? And his kind of example here is that from, to really understand this notion of privilege is that for, say, a marginalized community of color, they're forced to take the red pill because they have personally felt the experience of discrimination, of disadvantage, of their neighborhood being targeted by uh, inappropriate land uses. Um, they have a world experience that's very different from those of us who have not had that experience. And their experience is really important. So I'm going to ground this with a more kind of concrete example. I was in um, the Jamaica portion of New York, uh, kind of between Queens and Brooklyn a few weeks ago, on a panel talking about gentrification in New York City. Very uh, hot topic and a topic that inspires a lot of passion from folks. And so I was in a room about the size with about 100 community advocates from Brooklyn and Queens. And after our talk, which I think went really well, I had a gentleman stand up and say, you know, when I know trouble is coming is when I see those damn bike lanes coming into my neighborhood. And all, this, all around the room, I hear everyone kind of nodding their head in agreement that, oh yeah, once the bike lanes get there, we know this is a big problem. <laughs> and I have to, this is one of those instances where I was completely caught off guard. And we had to, you know, what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Because from his perspective, first comes the bike lanes. And that is powerfully symbolic because what that means is that the development community in the city has now put their target on my neighborhood. And with those bike lanes become, you know, come as he described them, the funny kids with glasses from you know, parts of Brooklyn who like to ride their bikes all the time. But what comes with that is gentrification. And so again, kind of dealing with that issue, my response to him is not, I need to educate you on the benefits of bike lanes. My response needs to be that wow, you have a very different experience of neighborhood change and what change in a neighborhood means to you, and I need to understand and respect that because those concerns you have are real, and you've seen your neighbors pushed out of your community. And so, you know, just want to contextualize this. This is why really robust engagement is so important so we can understand the worldview and experience of folks who live in these communities on a day-to-day -day basis. So connecting this issue back to urban farming with my last uh, two slides here, um, I want to talk about kind of those, the context of structural, where structural racism often comes into play in conversations and critiques that I've heard from community advocates when it comes to urban farming projects. First is history, and I'll get into this history issue. Um, the second, though, is this notion of kind of disadvantage and privilege. And I'm kind of paraphrasing quotes here I've heard from community advocates I've worked with before. The first notion here is this idea, this discomfort of outsiders coming into my community, not really understanding my community and pushing your values on my community. And so while you think that farming your own food is a very important thing to do for environmental reasons, moral reasons, et cetera, I may have different views on that but you're reshaping the landscape of my neighborhood, and that's disempowering to me. And a building off of that is this notion of not having agency. And so to go back to this quote here, if I'm kind of going to deconstruct this quote that this St. Louis resident is saying, what she's really saying is, I can't impact what happens in my own neighborhood. I wake up one morning, and a nonprofit group has come in, and suddenly, put in cornfields around my house. And that's really what's bothering me. I'm feeling disempowered. And so just being respectful of the fact that we preserve the agency of folks within these communities and that their agency has some precedent in terms of what we as outsiders decide to do in those neighborhoods. Last piece of this is kind of going into this notion of, of history. And a lot of the writing around structural racism talks about the importance of history in understanding the current way our communities work, look, also in understanding a lot of the inequity in our society, but that this history has a real impact on the way folks view the world today. 
And I'm going to talk about a narrative that I've had relayed to me numerous times, which was also held up by the literature, um, that urban farming sometimes inadvertently falls into. And it's a negative ne uh, narrative for many communities of color because it's a, a narrative of disempowerment. And this is the narrative of community land loss. So going back to the early part of the 20th century, where African Americans in the South were forced off their land through coercion, exploitation, um, threat of violence, to kind of the targeted destruction of many urban communities of color through urban renewal, through the highway program. And even though that history happened a half century ago, that's very prevalent in the minds of folks in those communities today. And we have to note the scale of some of these big interventions that have happened in the past. If the scale of urban renewal that happened in Atlanta happened in Columbus right now, we'd be demolishing the homes of 90,000 people, primarily the African American community, um, if you look at the demographics of who home, whose homes we'd be demolishing. So that narrative is fresh. And so when you're talking about coming into the community and taking this land and doing something with this land um, where folks don't feel like they're empowered to have control over what happens to the land, it feeds into this narrative and you're going to see this community resistance. And I've seen this narrative come up again and again from this concept of gentrification and the impacts of gentrification. We also see it in terms of the housing crisis and recession, where many communities of color have seen this really as the banking of the financial institution's land grab of homes within their neighborhood. And they have reason to support this. At the height of the housing crisis, Deutsche Bank was the largest landowner in the city of Cleveland. And that was primarily because of their foreclosure activity, which primarily happened in east side neighborhoods that were African American in the city of Cleveland. And so they've lived this experience continually of having their land taken. And you can understand this apprehension then of an outside organization, even well-intentioned, in taking large swaths of vacant property which to them may still have some future value in turning that into urban agriculture. So I don't present this in, in saying we shouldn't do urban agriculture. What I want to present this in is, is really giving you context and also giving you incentive to think about if urban agriculture is really going to be sustainable, it has to be embraced by those communities and they have to be actively engaged in supporting it and engaging with those communities in a very robust way not just educating them, not just informing them, but really engaging and partnering with them, giving them decision-making authority of, as to what happens to this vacant land that we're talking about reusing, that's a critical piece of building that community support. And that's the solution you need for long-term sustainability. So you know, my takeaway of this really is it's kind of simple. Just be respective of the history and the local perspectives and understand that there's a complexity there that many of us as outsiders coming into a community may not understand. And that perspective is important and it should be on the table and it should be part of our engagement with that community. So I'm gonna close with that, but I'll happy to take questions uh, after the panels today. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Professor Julie Gutman from the University of California at Santa Cruz. She's a professor of community studies there, as well as having published extensively on organic farming, on the politics of weight in the United States. Um, just bring her up here and allow her to speak for herself. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you. I'm really honored to be on this panel. I'm really honored to be here. I'm, um, um, my comments follow really quite well on um, Jason's. In fact, I think we make a few of the same points. Um, I'm sorry, we can't hear back here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Hello? Is it not on? No. Usually I'm so loud. <laughs> Usually I'm way loud. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, sorry. So anyways, my com I'm th first of all, I'm just, again, thrilled to be here. 
I'm thrilled to be on this panel with Jennifer and Jason. Um, my comments do follow on the heels of Jason's. Um, we make some of the same points. Now, coming from the airport the other day, somebody mentioned to me something that really hadn't quite hit me, even though it should have, that designers and planners are inherently optimistic. Um, and that made me a little worried for reasons you'll see. I'm, I'm a bit of a critic, a, a lot of a critic. Um, and so let me just say, position myself a little bit. I mean, I've been doing research on the politics of the alternative food movement for a good, well, nearing 20 years by now. And it started off with my dissertation that was about the paradoxes of organic farming in California. It went on, I went on to just look at alternative food movements more generally. It had to do with my work in community studies where I'm working with students who are doing six month full-time field studies with social justice and social change organizations. And they're all, they've all been, I work with the food and agriculture students. And so a lot of my critiques I've developed through um, kind of training my students before they go out about what they might see, but also listening to them when they come back. And so I've gotten, I've written a lot on race and food and alternative food movements and the politics of obesity and really problematizing the way that alternative food movements problematize obesity. So I'm kind of the resident critic. Um, so um, today I just kind of want to talk about, I want to talk about the limits and possibilities of food justice, which kind of touches on some of the things I've written about over the years and, and hopefully will give us more food for thought. So let me begin with a story, like many people are. Um, this is Earth Day 2012 and the waning days of the Occupy movement. A couple hundred people took over the Gill Tract. The Gill Tract um, is land owned by the University of California at Berkeley, but not adjacent to the campus. Um, and it's been an experiment station for the university for a good long time. Um, um, it's used for research, some agroecological. About 10 years ago, it was a site of protest um, because there was concern that biotech crops would be tested there. That never happened. But apparently there was a deal in the works to rezone the land, to lease out some of it to a Whole Foods, and to create a senior senator, a senior, a senior center, and a sports field on this um, fairly valuable land. So uh, a bunch of people came in, they set up tents, they planted many, many seedlings, um, and they said they wanted to show people how urban farming could feed the community. Now, one of the things they did that was very interesting is they, start, they started cutting off the diseased trees. And the agricultural experimenters were, of course, really frustrated because they were, had purposely induced disease to, to run their field trials. And they were like trimming and oh, we got rid of all the diseased trees. Aren't we doing well? Um, <clears throat> anyway, eventually they were pushed out by the police and arrests were made. Now, there's much to say about this, but for me, what was really striking was their demands. Basically, they said, we want to farm. We want a space where people can put their hands in the soil. We want to provide a model of how the community can support itself through growing, through farming. We want to grow our own food. What they didn't ask for was a change in the research priorities of the University of California to more sustainable methods. And this is a farm on university land. So in my view, that's quite indicative of the food justice movement, a movement that has lofty aspirations to transform food systems, but in practice has become nearly synonymous with urban agriculture, particularly today, and even growing your own food. So I want to talk a little bit about why that's happened and then talk about some of the limits of that approach. And if time permits, I can even suggest some hopeful pieces of where other ways we might think about achieving food justice. And I do recognize that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of you have investments um, in, in urban farming. And, and I hope you understand my, that these are friendly critiques. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to dismiss what people do, but I'm trying to really focus on what we're not doing that what, what would also, what would, would also take to move to a, a, a more sustainable and juster food system. So this is about encouraging more reflexivity. So what are we talking about when we talk about food justice? This is a recent book by Robert Gottlieb and Anna Puma Joshi. Um, and they, in their book, they define food justice. They say food justice seeks to ensure that the benefits and risks of where, what, and how food is grown, produced, transported, distributed, 
Access and Eaton are shared fairly. Food justice represents a transformation of the current food system, including but not limited to eliminating disparities and inequities. By striving to alleviate these injustices in the entire food system, the food justice movement is linked to and supports allied movements such as those related to the environment, land use, health, immigration, workers' rights, economic and community development, cultural integrity, and social justice. That's a pretty capacious definition. I have no problem with it whatsoever. But in practice, most food justice organizations focus on growing and providing sustainably grown food in low-income urban environments. And we hear so much of that. I mean, so much of what we're hearing at this conference is about that particular focus, obviously often in communities of color. So the manifestations of the food justice movement are mainly in, in these urban ag um, urban agriculture, community gardens, produce delivery services, often with a youth empowerment angle, um, and indeed that's exactly the kind of idea we see conveyed on this book's cover. So to understand why is it obtained that foci, we need to really pay attention to the origins of the movement. And in my reading, the origins really come out of critique. And I and I really say I really I think critique is important. I've seen in my time looking at alternative food movements, I've seen these really kind of um, substantial changes in the way think, people think about it. Food justice wasn't even on the table um, when I started doing this research. So, and that's been, and a lot of that's come from critique. So, I think we need to value that. So, but it mainly came from a critique of the mainstream alternative food movement um, and market-based approaches to food just uh, food system change, most associated with the ideas of voting with your dollar or voting with your fork. Um, now, there's lots to say about the limits of this. It obviously has its origins in the organic farming movement, and I've written a lot about that. And I don't have time to do that critique justice here. But the basic problem is that it's asking those who can to pay more for food that's grown in more um, socially just and ecological ways. So it, of course, begs the question, what about those who can't or don't want to pay more for that food? It's a very kind of limited system um, theory of change. So it's basically creating a system where the, the privileged get the good stuff and everyone else gets the dregs. Um, so that, that kind of approach, which is still widely popular, um, d creates the problem of affordability. And so as activists started recognizing that organic farming wasn't going to solve the problem of affordability, that led to new social movement attempts, including the community food security movement. Um, the community food security movement emphasized that both growers and consumers would do better economically if they cut out the middle man, the middle person. Um, so community food sec security put a great deal of emphasis on direct marketing arrangements, farmers markets, community supported agriculture, um, where supposedly both producers and consumers would benefit. Um, in practice, that particular win-win generally didn't happen. Some markets were organized to ensure high prices for farmers. This is a, from the Ferry Plaza Farmers Market in San Francisco, where the, the prices are just exorbitant. Um, not, you know, the kind of, what did we hear this morning? The sexy food, what, what was it? <laughs> yeah. Gilded Palace is a sexy food. That would be the Ferry Plaza. Um, there's other farmers markets that have much cheaper produce. It's more affordable for low-income consumers, but the farmers aren't making out very well. Um, there were additional issues. Um, folks recognized that nutritious food defined in less rarefied terms than local organic was lacking in many urban environments, um, creating a problem of geographic as well as economic access, and of course that led to the food desert critique um, that we has now become part of the lexicon. And I too have problems with the food desert um, language, um, not only because not all food deserts are in fact food deserts, there's food there, but also because of what it, this, kind, this kind of a cultural imperialism of suggesting <laughs> that certain neighborhoods are, um, are, are, are so deeply lacking. Um, so anyways, lack of access became the watchword, and you, um, you know, you've heard it here. And there was also an emerging critique, and this is where I start getting into Jason's points, that upscale alternative food was not resonating culturally 
in um, working class communities and communities of color, that it was too white. Here's some slides from stuff white people like. We've already heard about that. <laughs> So this is when you start to see the language of food justice, a language that deliberately borrows from environmental justice in two different ways. Um, one is that the environmental justice movement had noted that people of color were disproportionately exposed to pollution and other toxics. Um, so here, the injustice that they're in, uh, exposed to is, is bad food, um, lack of access. And the, but the environmental justice movement also arose because that they noted that the leadership in the, mainstream in the mainstream environmentalist movement was white and privileged. So food justice set out to be more race and, and class conscious. Mm -hmm. um, so many of the organizations under the banner of food justice set out to change the practices and idioms associated with alternative food to make food more culturally and economically accessible to people of color, less so working class whites, I would say. So to address the food desert problem, they set up shop in neighborhoods of color with a focus on getting fresh fruits and vegetables in convenience stores or having produce deliver, delivery services, um, low income CSAs or farmers markets. Here's on the right is some slide from um, Magdala Marketplace in West Oakland. People's Grocery, I should say that West Oakland seems to have more food, de uh, food justice act, uh, act activists than residents. <laughs> a lot of um, so the idea was to address the, um, is to make this food more culturally resident. Um, so a lot of these um, these venues started introducing co so-called culturally appropriate foods, collard greens, melons, and so forth. Um, now recently, um, this is a, this is a slide of an urban farm in. Um, St. Louis that I just happened to grab off the internet, but um, of course St. Louis has come up in the conversation a lot. Um, so recently the food justice movement has um, began focusing more and more on urban farms and community gardens as we know. Um, and here the idea is to further close the gap between producer and consumer to make them all, to, to actually to remove that gap at all so the producer is a consumer. These are also lauded for creating community and providing a safety net when public entitlements are lacking. Um, and not surprisingly, um, some urban gardens have really taken place in, um, in communities where public assistance is not readily available, particularly um, immigrant communities, particularly Latino immigrant communities who can't access SNAP. Um, now, the emphasis on self-provisioning has gone even a step further with the Food Not Lawns movement. We saw a little bit of that today. Now, for me, I, and we could obviously we could debate this because obviously we have different perspectives in the room, I find it quite striking that food justice has morphed into a movement for self-provisioning. Um, in effect, a justice, uh, in effect, a concept that derives from liberal philosophy about a common good is being re reconfigured as self-sufficiency. And I find that really quite striking. Um, but for now, let me say that there is lots of exciting stuff about this. Clearly, food activism has galvanized young people in a big way. There are more food initiatives in more cities than we could have possibly imagined even 15 years ago. Funders are paying attention. They love funding the food justice projects. And in many ways, the food movement, as a way it's playing out right now, is the most successful of its day. It's hard to think of anything else we've seen in the last 30 years that seems to have such a positive impact. And implicit in, in these movements are um, critiques of wealth and power a newfound consciousness about the, the commodification of food and a healthy skepticism of industrial food. So that's all to the good. And let's face it, there's a lot more good food. And I, I'll say I love good food. So um, that's an important piece. But I'm obviously skeptical. Um, so the question is why? What's wrong with this approach? Well, I would like to raise four issues. One, of the, one set of problems is quite practical and um, Jason went through them at length, so I'll just be brief here, but we're talking about problems of access to land, the insecurity of land tenure, 
Many urban farms are placeholders. If and when real estate markets get going again, we'll there's a likelihood that that land will be lost. And I couldn't help but thinking when we were listening about the stories about Detroit, I'm just like, you know, I, I come from the Bay Area, right? And so, you know, right now, I don't know if you've heard because apparently the economy is booming and I'm thinking, where is that? Oh, right, Silicon Valley. Twitter's located in San Francisco and we have the Google buses taking, using uh, public um, transportation uh, parking things to shuttle people from San Francisco down to Silicon Valley. Anyways, huge pressure on real estate markets in San Francisco, where there also are a lot of urban farms. My thinking about Detroit is this. It, land's really, really cheap there. This is exactly when capital goes in and invests. So what happens when that happens? And when all those white hipsters are there ready to, to, to I don't know if it's be an internet company, but you can imagine that this, this is a possibly temporary condition in Detroit that we need to take seriously. Um, so. Urban farms is the gateway to gentrification. We've been hearing about that, and uh, we can talk about it more. The second, um, the second issue is it's not clear. It's this, these food justice um, projects, many of, them, many of them still don't resonate. Um, people who are food insecure because they work one or more low-paying jobs, if they have a job, are not all that excited about growing their own food. Having to grow and cook your own food can seem like an added injustice, better an income that can pay for good food. Um, for many people who are the objects of food justice programs, farming and gardening is not something they look, for, they look at with an affection and nostalgia. For African Americans in particular, getting your hands dirty in the soil evokes not a romantic history, but a brutal one. And we hear this a lot in, in some of the projects that are where um, they're working with kids to teach kids about farming. And the kids say, I don't want to do that work. That's slaves' work. Um, that's what they're willing to say. Um, and also something that, that um, Jason ra ra uh, raised, some people really resent the alternatives. Um, I had a student who worked for an, I, I, an, an organization whose name I won't mention, but had a mobile food truck. And she was talking to her neighbor one day, and the neighbor said, I don't want to buy off that truck. All they have is bird seed. I want to get real food. Many people say, I want to, we just wish we had a Safeway in our neighborhood. And the supermarkets may well guarantee anonymity and standardization that for some is something that's to, to be desired. Um, and a third and a really important issue is that these food justice projects continue to put quite a bit of emphasis on food consumption, even though some of the worst injustices are in food production. And here I just want to say a little bit about food workers, which I could talk at length about. But there are 40 million people who work in the food sector in this country. They are some of the worst paid, working the most dangerous jobs, and, and in farm work are regularly exposed to pesticides and other toxics. When we talk, when we talk about cutting out the middleman, what does that even mean for the jobs that do exist? Those are real issues. So basically, we have an approach to food system change today that at best ignores the workforce in the food system. To me, that's not tenable. And the fourth related issue is this approach to food justice promotes alternatives. And this is actually the thing I really want to focus on for the rest of my talk, because this is, I think, is a take home point. That the approach promotes alternatives rather than contests what's wrong. Alternatives are not, and, that's, I, don't, and I want to tell you why. Um, and this is, is where I make my audiences uncomfortable, or more uncomfortable if I've not already made you uncomfortable. Um, so I want to acknowledge some of the arguments for alternatives. As a, um, so you know, I thought about them, and I think there's some validity in them. I'm not dismissing them entirely. So one is, of course, we need to build models. Of course we do. We, if um, we want to start transforming industrial agriculture, to more um, sustainable methods. We need the knowledge of biodynamic farmers, of organic farmers who've figured out a way to do it differently. We absolutely need that. So you do need to have models of how you can do things differently. We need to have, if we don't want to have large corporations, we need to think about cooperatives or other ways of doing things. So that's absolutely right. Now there's, 
thing that I hear a lot. Well, we need to make people feel good. Of course we need to pick, make, make people feel good. And that's one of the things that's been so attractive about alternative food movements. People can feel very good. They get to eat good food. They, if they like cooking and gardening, I don't, I, I'm not a big farmer, I like cooking. But if they like that, they can do it. It, it, it feels like a, a, a kind of politics that everybody can get behind because, or because it seems fun, at least to some people. Um, so that's one thing, is you want to give people a good experience in social change, not what sometimes is the hard work of social change. Um, you need to develop resilience, relative aut autonomy, um, and exist in opposition to neoliberal forms. So it's really basically about embracing the politics of hope. And I get that, and I get that that's what's driving a lot of alternatives. And I understand now, being in a conference with designers and planners, that you know, these are things that, that are, that you can think of, it's po you can think of what's possible, right? So that's driving a lot of this. But here are my concerns. Um, one is the kind of small scale problem, the drop, drop in the bucket. Um, I, that's not my biggest concern. I think, um, as we've heard, I think there's possibilities and uh, ways to think about scaling up, um, but that's one of them. Um, a second concern is, um, they, the, a lot of these projects tend to be driven by groups with relatively more privilege. Um, we've seen that a lot. The photos of a lot of the urban farms we've seen in Detroit are, um, are of, with white people. And you know, I know from working with my students um, who tend to be fairly privileged, you know, when they, um, you know, when after, after Katrina in New Orleans, they all wanted to go to, Natreet, to New Orleans to help, now they all want to go to Detroit, they want to teach people how to eat, they want to teach people how to garden. This, they're the ones bringing these ideas, this is exactly what um, Jason was talking about, that, and people are, you know, where they're going, and my students come home and say this, they say, they, they didn't like it, they didn't, it didn't resonate, you know, so now, now my students are, are much more educated about their own kind of investment in, in trying to make these changes and they're getting much more reflexive about what they do. Um, anyways, these, a lot of these projects are driven by people with relatively more privilege. Um, some of them are very inward focused. They tend to neglect those outside the sphere of community, local food movements, um, I, I'm, I'm particularly harsh on local food movements because I live in California where the locavore movement brags that you can, you know, you can eat in August from the local economy in, in the central coast of California. I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the whole world could eat from the central coast in California. <laughs> I mean, this is the most productive agricultural land that grows in, in August. Maybe 300 crops are grown, you know, so you, you forgo coffee and bananas and chocolate. Um, but you know, a lot, many producers around the world have been brought into export markets through colonial and post-colonial relations, and the kind of the inward focus of going local doesn't solve their problem. So that's that, that's the whole other kind of issue. But here's a concern that really bothers me: is that it really allows the bad stuff to exist uncontested, um, even if we can figure out how to scale up these. All these projects, these urban, urban farming, the, the corporations that bring us big food are not going to go away. They're not going to go away. They're not going to change their practices until we figure out ways to do that. Um, so that's my biggest issue. So in effect, by only focusing on building these alternatives, um, we're getting a bifurcated food system. We're getting great food for the few or, and well-located, including well-located by, um, for, you know, close to activists, and, and kind of crap for the rest, and, um, including those who work in the food system. Now, I really want to make this clear, because this point often gets lost in my talks. You need to have both. I'm not saying we don't have alternatives. I'm not saying we don't do any of that work. Like, again, if we want to have, if we want to contest industrial agriculture, we need to figure out ways, other ways of producing food. And indeed, in my research, I found that actually existing growers are much more willing to move to sustainable methods when they see that there are viable agronomic alternatives. So right now I'm doing this research on the strawberry industry in California. Growers are facing um, the face out of uh, methyl bromide, a, a ozone depleter, and a highly toxic fumigant. And they're all freaked out 
because they kept on thinking they were going to get critical use exemptions, and right now there's not a really good non-chemical alternative to um, methyl bromide or the other equally toxic fumigants that, that they can live with because strawberries are so high value and they don't, they, they, you know, they'd have to really change their whole business model. So um, on the flip side, I've, I've seen um, many organic growers, or many once, uh, early, previous conventional growers moved to organic production because they were worried about having their tools taken away and they started experimenting. Anyway, so you need to have both alternatives and opposition. But what I see is that the vast majority of actually existing political practices are in building alternatives and not contesting the bad stuff. Indeed, at the same time, the community gardens and direct marketing and farming and cooking education programs have proliferated. There's comparatively little focus on the policy arena, on multilateral concerns, or even on grassroots movements that somehow change corporate practices. And, and seriously, like there are, how many gardens do we hear about in Detroit? The hundreds? We see, and every, you know, I think every city, certainly every city with a college community has at least one or two food justice organizations. So there's thousands of food justice organizations in the country. I can count the organizations doing policy work on, on probably one hand. I think that's really, really, and I don't mean, I don't mean that everybody has to be a policy wonk, but the, the organizations that are, re, are really trying to change corporate practice or change policies to induce better behavior. So I'm not saying it's grassroots versus policy, but I'm saying it's about there's not enough work being done that's oppositional and it's all been on um, focusing on the alternatives. How am I on time? Two or three minutes. Okay, well, I could talk more about why I think that's happening. You know, I, I think I already mentioned that, you know, I see through my students what kind of motivates them. Um, but I just want to, I just, I think what I will do is mention a couple um, examples of what can happen when we, uh, we get oppositional. And one is, it's, um, I, I think we can look at the anti-biotech movement, and um, there's this great book called Fighting for the Future of Food that talks about the strategy, the, the long-term strategy of the anti-biotech movement relative to the biotech industry. And we could say, how, how, how successful can we say the anti-biotech movement is, is? I mean, there's, you know, there's GE crops all over the world. But what this book effectively argues is that there will be many, many, many more um, crops with, you know, with GE application, or many more uh, GE um, en genetically engineered crops in commercial use today were there not the opposition of this movement. Because there is so, you know, the, the industry it, uh, has to, um, it takes a lot of investment to bring a commercial crop to, uh, to fruition. And so when they start seeing a lot of protests and they start seeing a lot of scientific, um, or sci dissident scientists complaining about the crops, they think, they think twice about bringing that crop to fruition. So we, if we look at it counterfactually, we can say that the anti-GE uh, movement has been pretty successful. I think they're quite strategically strategic. And then the other one, oops, I don't want to give that one to you yet. Um, the other one I want to point to is this um, uh, more local fight we had um, in California. I'm doing, this is my current research. Um, and so methyl iodide was a um, chemical that was introduced to replace methyl bromide. It's more toxic than methyl, methyl bromide. It's used to induce cancer in laboratory rats. And um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the California Department of Pesticide Regulation uh, released, uh, approved the use of methyl iodide against the recommendation of their, uh, of their, re of their internal scientists. Um, but there was a, hu a huge protest, not the usual suspects, not the foodies, not the urban gardeners, but farm workers and farm worker families and environmental groups and California Rural Legal Assistance. And um, the company ended up withdrawing it from the U.S. market after all this. The battle's not over. There's still other chemicals. But now I'm one, that's one of the things we're studying right now is how are strawberry farmers in California reacting? Are they going to now kind of start 
taking more serious non-chemical alternatives if they think they're going to start, they're going to see more and more protests like that. So it's possible. It takes a lot, it's a lot harder. It takes a lot of organizing and it's kind of one victory at a time, but it's possible to change corporate practices. So I think we need to take that seriously. Um, so I think I want to end it there. And thank you for being here and thank Jesus for our food as well. <laughs> Uh, for the session last speaker is Jennifer Jordan, who's a sociologist from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. She has uh, written and published on cultural memory and embodied forms of heritage, mostly in Central Europe, but I know she's got an eye on Chicago as well. So uh, please welcome Jennifer Jordan. So like uh, Julie and Jason, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, and I'm really excited to be on this panel. Um, <clears throat> it may seem at first that what I'm saying has little connection um, to the two speakers before me, um, but I actually think that there's um, tremendous overlap, and I think that it just may take a little while to kind of put those pieces together, and I may not do that for you. I may leave that um, in your hands, but I actually see these projects as very kind of mutually constitutive um, and supporting one another. Can I move this computer out of my zone? Oh, it's okay. Um, okay. So um, my talk will also be a little different in style, I think, than, than some of what we've seen today. Um, and I want to start by saying that seeing the images last night of those peach walls, um, which is actually something that weirdly I write a lot about um, for a sociologist, that's peach walls and espalier are not classic topics of sociological inquiry, um, but I have, have turned them into that. Um, and also looking at the visions of cheerful, optimistic young architects um, envisioning new worlds, um, that was also very familiar from my time that I spent in Berlin, um, living there and you know, interviewing a lot of architects, a lot of city planners, um, and so I, you know, like many people in this room, have made that sort of connection between material space and between cities um, and then the kinds of things we eat. Um, the, the thread for me that connects those things is memory um, and the connections between memory and materiality. Um, so I'm not talking here about memory, you know, brain chemistry, but memory, social memory, collective memory, the stories that we tell each other in order to understand the past or in order to produce um, kind of shared understandings of that past. Um, mostly today I will talk about tomatoes, um, <laughs> of course, as sociologists do. Um, <laughs> but I also want to talk about how I got to tomatoes um, and then what I'm doing post-tomato um, because I'm, I'm just currently in the post-tomato phase. Um, and. Um, I don't want to just, you know, list my CV, you know, for the purposes of self-aggrandizement, but because I think that this sort of trajectory of projects is very relevant to a lot of the kinds of questions that we're all trying to grapple with in our very different disciplines, right? That's another thing to, that's wonderful about a conference like this is that we come at it with such different tools, such different styles of posing questions, of answering questions, of representing the material that we found. Um, Okay, so in all of my work, um, really embarrassingly since high school, um, so that's some serious nerd credibility, um, I, I have been interested in the connections between memory and identity. So I even wrote high school term papers about sort of space and place um, and power, and that's why that was, is a whole other long story. Um, but um, I'm always interested in this sort of memory and identity on the one hand, and place and materiality on the other. Um, and I really began, let's see if I can do this right, there we go, um, my career as an urbanist. Um, and um, 
wrote a book about memory and forgetting in the landscape of Berlin. And, and I think it's very important when we talk about memory also to talk about forgetting. And I actually think that that's very relevant to thinking about food as well. Um, so in the Berlin project, um, I looked at sort of how this happens, right? On the, the building on the right used to look like the building on the left. Um, this picture I took in 1996 um, in Lichtenberg, in sort of deep in East Berlin. Um, and you can see very sort of viscerally the, the erasure of, of the past, and for obvious reasons, right? Do you really want to live with bullet holes um, and blown out windows? My apartment at the time had windows, but it also had bullet casings, or you know, bullets sort of still stuck in the walls, and my balcony had been blown off um, by, presumably by the Russians, you know, at the very end of the war. Um, but those, if you go to Berlin today, every one of those traces is gone with a few exceptions where people have sort of intentionally mark that past. Um, so I'm interested in how people make and understand their worlds, right? Their social and their physical landscapes. Um, and when I finished the Berlin book, uh, and this is actually on the cover, I took this picture in 1996, the book came out in 2006, and when I took the picture I thought, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if that were the cover of my book? And a decade later, um, it was, which was nice. Um, but when I finished that, you know, I have to find a new project. Um, and so I started looking at living history museums, thinking that they might be a logical place to keep thinking about materiality and memory. Um, and as I was doing that, I was feeling like there, oh, there was something uninteresting about the questions I was asking. There's just something, a lack of kind of some spark or crackle. Um, and then, oops, one day um, I had a little apple epiphany, um, and this, I love that we're at a conference where Espalier has at least been shown twice um, in, in the images, um, but I was looking at this tree, and this is in the Living History Museum um, on the eastern edge of Austria, um, very close to the um, Slovakian border, and I just started thinking about how weird it was that these museums were using not just buildings and old farm implements and clothing to talk about the past, but using living things, using trees, using vegetable gardens. Um, there, I have a picture, which I don't have in my presentation, of the compost pile, right? So the idea of a historical compost pile, um, these ways of sort of conveying to people how people used to live in the past. And so I'm looking at this apple tree. This is a young apple tree, right? This is not an apple tree, or relatively young. This is not an apple tree from the mid-19th century, per se. Um, right? It moves into the present through a series of grafts, um, right? It sort of gets grafted onto new rootstock every so often so that that sort of genetic material that's at the heart of that apple is brought into the, into the present, um, but the apple itself obviously is not, right? The origins are, are long gone. And the other thing that struck me about this apple tree is that little sign there, right? The idea, so you have a, a living history museum that's supposed to say this is how people lived. Well, they didn't live with little signs indicating to themselves, you know, this is a historically important apple tree, right? It's just an apple tree. It's not labeled. Um, and I interviewed the gardener later, and one of the interesting things she told me was that wherever they have signs, the fruit just gets stripped off the tree the second that it becomes ripe enough, and so they stopped putting up signs. Um, so there are equally historic trees and whatever else um, that keep their fruit because people are like, oh, that must not be an important tree. It's lacking a sign. Um, and to me, you know, that's a bigger message too about narration, right? And about my Berlin work also was about this idea that, that stones don't speak for themselves, right? And apples and tomatoes also don't speak for themselves. Um, we attach narratives to them that then, you know, whether it's stones or apples, uh, or tomatoes that then shape how we interact with those things. Um, so I had that my small epiphany, and that then, you know, as happens, turned into a, another book. Um, and I researched a lot about tomatoes actually after this because it was a very easy example to say, okay, how do we, how does a tomato become an heirloom, right? How, how does something so fragile, so perishable, become something that we think? we can hand down from one generation to the next. And again, we're not handing down the tomato. We're handing down the seeds. We're handing down the genetic material contained within that, um, that tomato. So um, that book is called Edible Memory, which I'm hoping will be out 
within a year or so. Um, and there, again, I try to understand how a tomato becomes an apple, or <laughs> that's not what I try to understand. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome if that's what I were doing. Um, but <laughs> uh, how a tomato becomes an heirloom, how an apple becomes an antique. Um, and I also have chapters on um, what I call forgotten turnips. Um, so turnips and other things that don't become as hyped as heirloom tomatoes um, or antique apples, but that still are the sort of subject of this kind of preservation work. Um, I have a chapter that's about sort of remembered mangoes um, and, and then forgotten stone fruit, um, so thinking too about perishability and geography um, and, and to some extent nostalgia. Um, but all, all, and all of it has this sort of sense of connections between food, memory, biodiversity, and place, that these things are connected to one another. Um, and when, let's see, where I am, whoops, was that moving ahead without me? No. Um, so when we as a society forget certain foods, right, sort of forget in quotation marks, but when we forget certain foods, we also lose germplasm, um, right, we use the raw material, lose the raw material of those foods, um, and we also lose practices of cultivation, um, preparation and preservation, um, as well as habits and even appetites. Um, and that's, that's not a judgment about losing, but it's just saying that's part of the transformation, and that's been happening forever, right? Food comes in and out of fashion. If we take the sort of long, you know, picture looking back, we see that sort of ebb and flow. Um, so that's not inherently a critique, but that's saying that forgetting has implications within food systems um, and in the sort of also not only kind of botanical way, but also in a, in a cultural way. Um, so um, thinking about, you know, what what tastes good to us, um, the ways in which our tastes in apples, for example, have, have changed. Um, there's, if anyone's ever read um, The Anatomy of Dessert by Bunyard, which I think is from the 20s, if I'm not mistaken, he has these incredible descriptions of apples and these sort of essentialist ideas of national tastes in apples. Um, so he says the same apple will be eaten in France at what he calls the fondant stage, which to me sounds disgusting. <laughs> like it's, it's sort of... Um, taffy, you know, it's been on the tree so long that it has, um, it's just full of sugar and it's sort of soft um, versus the, you know, at a different stage of harvesting, it would have had a very different flavor, a different palate experience. And the idea that those appetites for those kinds of apples are sort of coming out of not some, you know, essential Frenchness, um, but out of decades or centuries of habits, you know, of, of sort of what you, um, what people are eating around you, what your you know, family is giving to you and saying, oh, isn't this a delicious apple? Um, whereas today you might say, wow, fondant apples are not my cup of tea. Um, so we have these sort of connections between memory and forgetting. Um, in my work on tomatoes, and this, by the way, Julie is um, at Earthbound in Carmel Valley, so the, you know, their sort of public farm. Um, but, um, I'm interested in how sort of perishability becomes an heirloom, and the making of an heirloom is a long process, right? Once upon a time, there were no heirloom tomatoes. There were exactly the, you know, the tomatoes that we think of as heirlooms today, but people were not like, in 1850, I'm gonna go eat an heirloom tomato right now, right? The, the sort of the break hadn't happened that allows you to conceive of these things as heirlooms. Um, so open pollinated, old fashioned, flavorful, fragile, all the qualities that we may associate with heirloom tomatoes, that was just a tomato. Um, and so that changes over time. The tomato itself, of course, began long ago in South America and then Central America. Um, and the heirloom phenomenon I, I write about is just the most recent stage in the tomato's long history of geographic mobility and cultural and botanical transformation. So tomatoes moved from the new world to the old, where they were, as many of you know, long thought to be poisonous, back to the new. Um, and there's, there are tomatoes just down there toward the right. This is a really fun picture to look at in depth when you start to sort of pick out the different fruits and vegetables um, from different places. Um, but um, so tomatoes come back. Uh, to North America, having been sort of modified and new varieties developed in Europe, um, come back to, to the New World. Um, and let's see, um, 
oops, and then, oh, so in the 19th and 20th century, they're sort of open pollinated, more biodiverse, and then with the industrialization of agriculture, we get, you know, predictability, uniformity, the ability to go to the supermarket and know, oh, there's going to be a tomato, it's going to look like this. This is a, you know, a farmer's market, it's not the best example of that, but those are, they're still nice, uniform, um, Roma, no spray, um, and, um, and can be in a crate like that, where the, and the bottom ones aren't getting squished, um, right, which that's already a, um, quite a feat. Um, and I remember growing up in California seeing the tomato trucks driving down the, the highway on family road trips. And, you know, it's a tomato truck that's like taller than this chalkboard. What's going on at the bottom of that truck? Like what, you know, what sort of tomato squish um, is happening? And apparently not a lot, right? They're sort of harvested at a moment where they can be um, somewhat robust. Um, but at any rate, um, so we get this, this uniformity um, and predictability and at the end, which is, as shoppers at the grocery store, right, that's a desirable quality. You want to know it's going to be there. Um, but at the same time, in the, you know, behind the scenes, off, oops, off the beaten track, um, people are holding on to old varieties um, and, and holding on to their favorite tomato, right, or their grandparents' favorite tomato, growing it in, I don't know why it keeps going ahead, um, growing it in um, their backyards and in community gardens in, you know, which community gardens have been around for a while, so that's not, um, you know, they could have been growing them in, in victory gardens in, um, in the 1940s. Um, and, oops, okay, we'll go to seed service exchange. So, so we have all this off the beaten path, sort of grassroots, that then coalesces into bigger organizations that are doing this kind of seed saving. So this is the, um, I think that's Diane's garden um, at seed, seed service exchange in Iowa. Um, and, you know, this is a space where things are being grown, but also very much being communicated, right? Very much being curated. And a narrative about food is being presented there, including specific history. So you see the bigger signs there tucked into the garden that are saying who brought these seeds to Seed Savers Exchange, right? Whose family is this connected to? What kind of a personal history and then also social history does this have? Um, let's see. So then it... it one of the things I did in my research was simply look at newspaper mentions of the phrase heirloom tomato, right? Because at a certain point, it emerges onto the scene. Um, at first, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, we have it mostly being discussed in the context of gardening. Um, and then it moves into uh, things like farmer's markets. This is from Paris. I just like that it's too bad that that sort of chalk is rubbed out. But that in French, you know, it's a, ancien is a, the word for traditional, right? So the traditional... Um, this is a traditional tomato being sold, which is more or less the translation, I think, for an heirloom tomato. Um, so we get them in farmer's markets. Um, that's, that was just this summer in, um, in Chicago, um, the Nichols Farm tomatoes. And, and then in the 90s, tomatoes really take off in restaurant reviews, right? So I have in this, my heirloom tomato article this chart where you just see the, the restaurant reviews mentioning heirloom tomatoes just skyrocket. And so they're clearly becoming a status symbol. Um, you see them, you know, people kind of demonstratively consuming uh, heirloom tomatoes or um, an actor, I don't know why I remember this, but Vincent Gallo getting sent um, an heirloom tomato salad by somebody else at the restaurant, right, as a sign of kind of esteem um, for this famous person sitting near you. Um, and, and so tomatoes, you know, reach these kind of echelons of popularity of fame and also of expense. Um, but part of what this research shows is that all of that's happening over here while people are still doing what they've been doing with tomatoes over here. And in fact, access increases to things like seed, um, right? Your ability to acquire, if you do want to grow your own tomatoes, um, which I'm not advocating as a solution to bigger tomato problems, um, but if you do, you, the biodiversity available to you is actually much greater today than it was, let's say, 25 years ago. Um, and so that, that transformation has occurred. It's very different from things like bluefin tuna or beluga caviar. When they become status symbols, when people, when wealthy people want to eat them, there is literally less for everybody else. Um, with tomatoes, um, sort of elites eating them has actually in some ways not affected, you know, some realms of tomato con consumption and then actually improved um, in an indirect way other kinds of access. Um, 
So this happens in part then through the pursuit of the kind of exoticism and authenticity that the sociologists Johnston and Bauman talk about. Um, and I'm assuming not a lot of you read a, a lot of sociology, but they wrote a book called Foodies that I think might be of interest um, to many people. Um, and it's something called, like democracy and distinction, something, something in food. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting look at how people sort of code um, different kinds of foods as exotic or authentic and kind of and what that might mean. So definitely worth a read. Um, so again, even as heirloom tomatoes become a status symbol, um, they also become increasingly available. Um, and they show up in many of the kinds of places that we've been talking about all day today, right? Certainly some people are growing hybrids. And I write about this in my book about how my great, great aunt, who was a cattle rancher, who one would think of as being kind of an heirloomy cook, right? She baked pies in her uh, cast iron stove every day for her ranch hands, who all had a quarter of a pie for breakfast before they went out um, to the cattle ranch. Um, so here she is making things in a wood stove, but hybrid tomatoes were her favorite, right? She's like, I can count on these. I know what they're going to do in my garden. And, and they're new and kind of exciting. So she was really into hybrid tomatoes. So, you know, I don't want to, to fetishize the heirloom at all, but rather to watch, like, how do people interact with these things? And how do people invest these foods with these kinds of meanings? Um, so a tomato becomes an heirloom tomato over time. And I think that's really important to think about the ways in which the meanings we assign to food, but also appetites and habits, how those things also change over time. Within the course of a lifetime, yes, but I'm also talking over time sort of centuries. I think telescoping back a little bit to, to think about um, food trends more broadly um, and to think about how, on the one hand, how deep-seated appetites are, but also how, how changeable um, they are over time as well. Um, Let's see. So in the phenomenon of, um, of the heirloom, taste shapes the world, right? Other things shape taste, but taste has, has tangible effects on the landscapes we inhabit um, and on the world around us. So the appetites for the flavors and stories of heirloom foods lead both to their preservation by farmers and gardeners off the beaten path and to their pursuit by urban diners and shoppers, all of which contributes to the preservation of edible biodiversity. How am I doing on? Oh, good. Okay. Because um, I, I have like 35 slides of apples here too. So let's see how far I, I get with tomatoes. <laughs> um, so um, the tomatoes then occupy just one chapter of the edible memory book um, and just one part of a somewhat maybe maniacal um, fascination with memory and growing things. Um, with, you know, my Berlin book had so much to do with death and with violence, um, and this work has so much to do in many ways with life um, and sort of looking for this kind of creativity. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm not going to get to apples quite yet. We'll stay in there. Um, so in addition to edible memory, um, I have two newer projects that I, I think speak to the themes uh, being talked about here, and then I just I want to bring up one I call landscapes of memory, um, and this is work um, that I've done on gardens specifically on on kitchen gardens, and so I've written an article about it, and I have like a half written book, which is a really great way not to finish your current book is to write half of the next book. Um, and then if you really want to up the ante, you can start writing a third book before you finished the. <laughs> So I finished, the, you know, whatever, some, but anyway, um, maybe that's just how, how creativity can happen, um, and I shouldn't worry too much about it. Um, but at any rate, so this Landscapes of Memory project is a way of looking not just at the foods themselves, but looking at the places in which foods are produced. Um, and kitchen gardens, for those of you who sort of study historical gardens, um, which is obviously one bunch of people in this room and completely not the other bunch of people in this room, um, but... Kitchen gardens vanish, um, right? They leave very little behind. Um, sometimes garden walls, um, certainly, but the, the things being grown in kitchen gardens themselves, they don't leave a good archaeological record. Um, and they don't leave much paper record either, um, right? People, it's rare to have elaborate um, sort of written records of 
vegetable gardens in the way that you may have of ornamental gardens. Um, and even so, a lot of this research started in Europe. You know, a lot of ornamental gardens in Europe use box hedges. Um, and so box hedges leave little stumps. Um, and with the little stumps, you can begin to sort of understand the contours of, um, of these gardens. And, you know, one place that I was looking at, they were able to really recreate the old Baroque um, pleasure gardens because there was all this archaeological evidence, because there were paintings by Canaletto of what those gardens looked like. And they're like, we don't, you know, obviously this was a huge operation. There was a huge kitchen garden somewhere. They don't even know where it is, right? They want to pay some undergrads from the University of Vienna to come out and sort of sift the soil for a while and see if they can sort of find remnants of some of those gardens. Um, no one bothered to really write stuff down about them. No one certainly bothered to paint them, um, right, or create engravings of them. And so, I mean, I, that's sort of a metaphor for the broader process by which gardening um, and sort of kitchen gardens shift with larger geopolitical changes, with larger technological changes. So the vanishing of all these kitchen gardens in Europe and there's tons of kitchen gardens. I'm not saying that they're all gone, but I'm saying certain uh, kitchen gardens vanish as systems of distribution change, as labor practices change, right? As industrialization and urbanization occur, um, these places of sort of a different kind of edible memory disappear from the landscape. And charting that disappearance can help us think about sort of connections between broader social change and this kind of, um, you know, more mundane or, or daily practice of, of feeding yourself, right? And of sort of how that's happening, who's doing that work, um, and again, where it's taking place, right? So I loved seeing the images yesterday of the sort of gardens tucked into city walls and roofs and whatever else at different moments, where if you walk through there today, you would have no idea. You know, there's not a memorial plaque that says, here stood, you know, a rhubarb patch um, in, you know, whatever, year. Um, but I, I, I think charting that sort of disappearance and maybe reemergence sometimes is a way of also understanding these broader um, connections. And so that's, that's a big project and I actually want to take it far beyond Europe and I think it helps us think about sort of historical aspects of, of kitchen gardens. Um, and then in addition, and this is the way in which I am not finishing the Landscapes of Memory book, is that um, I, when I finished edible me my edible memory book, I started working on foraging. Um, so I started looking beyond the garden wall because in all of this research on both heirlooms and on gardens, I kept seeing sort of things happening outside of that space um, and people assigning meaning to wild things um, and sort of practices that brought wild things into non-wild spaces. Um, and so that project has at one end um, a restaurant, does anyone want to guess the name of this restaurant that's at one end of that spectrum? It's in Denmark. <laughs> Noma, so um, Noma has been voted the best restaurant in the world the last three years, um, or maybe not this last year, but before that. Um, and Rene Redzepi, the chef there, as you know, sort of the world's best chef, and one of the things he's known for doing is serving things like lichen and pine needles, um, you know, processed, not just a bowl of, of pine needles, um, but, but integrated into his cuisine. So how you take things that are free, um, you know, that are sort of more traditionally seen as the food of, you know, rural um, people sort of living closer to places where you can forage, how do you take those things and put them in the center of very expensive plates of food, right, in very expensive, very elite, elite, like, um, kinds of restaurants. There's another, there's Faviken in northern Sweden. You have to fly to get to the restaurant, and, like, it's hard to even drive to it. Um, and, and the website almost says that the language isn't quite there, but it's basically saying you will be served what has traditionally been consumed on this estate, and the implication is you get to eat like a peasant. Right, the, the implication is not you get to eat the sort of fancy food of the nobility, but it's like, no, this is a special thing. You get to eat the, in the way that people may have eaten here in the 13th century, um, when you know they were sort of having to live exclusively off of what was available. So that's one extreme. The other end, um, wait, let's have one in the middle, um, which is Steve Brill foraging in Central Park. Um, 
right? Telling people, look at all the food that is in Central Park. Um, look at this landscape that we think of as decorative and ornamental, but that is actually uh, sustaining, right, that is actually edible and nutritive. Of course, there's all kinds of conversations, too, about it being toxic. Um, he was also arrested um, at one point for um, gathering things, and then very soon thereafter hired by the city of New York um, to lead tours uh, and show people how, how to do this gathering. And then another sort of edge of that, that continuum is thinking about um, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization's recent attempts to basically rebrand foraging. Um, and to, to say, oh, wait a minute, like, sorry, you know, that we gave you a lot of information about not foraging um, and about trying to shift people into to agricultural production more exclusively, but realizing both the sort of calories available and the kind of sustenance available in foraging um, and also the complexity of as people gain a little bit of prosperity, the meaning of foraging changes, right? And so that's part of what I find as a sociologist fascinating about this project is you have one act which is foraging, right? Which is going out, ideally with scissors, right? That's in every foraging handbook, it says bring scissors. Um, not, you don't want to be yanking things out. Um, and you also you know, may want gloves if you're harvesting nettles, but some people say if you're good at it, you don't even need the gloves. You can get your nettles without getting stung. Um, but the point is, it's, it's this activity is very similar. You know, scanning the forest floor, looking for things where you th you're pretty sure you know you're going to find them, but it's engaged in by so many different people, and then it takes on so many different both cultural meanings and also sort of financial implications. So again, to code, the dandelion is one example, right, where it's people expend a tremendous amount of energy getting rid of it while other people are very excited about collecting it and consuming it. Um, and so that's a sort of easy example, but also in the broader sense of how do we think about what is edible um, and, and in what context is it edible? Um, okay, thank you. And in what context is it something to be you know, ruthlessly eradicated? Um, and so there, there are sort of botanical realities about that, but then there are also these important, I think, kind of cultural and spatial and even political contexts in which that happens. So I think I'll go ahead and wrap up there. Thank you. Thank you, Brooks, for the toughest question I'll get asked all day. <laughs> um, Brooks and I used to work together for years, so it's good to see you. Um, in regards to the, the realities of funding available for the food justice movement, um, you know, community organizing is hard, it's resource intensive, and you know, to be quite candid, the money's probably not there right now. But I want to add that, you know, kind of working around community development issues in a lot of different domains, the money's not there in a lot of domains. And I actually think at the heart of this is really got to be more in-depth collaboration between sectors so that we can open up the resources needed to do the robust engagement that we need with communities, not just around food justice, but other issues that are shaping the life experience of folks in negative ways in those neighborhoods. Um, you raise a really good question in terms of federal support. And I can say as a, you know, working on HUD's Sustainable Communities Initiative, um, there is certainly space at HUD to consider food as a piece of development policy. But I would say, again, it's on the margins. And as we think about food justice, 
I, I think you know this notion of lobbying around policy is really important. Um, why isn't HUD funding more of this on a large scale? Um, why aren't other federal agencies putting more money into this domain? Um, so I think you raise good questions, and I think it does come back to the policy advocacy piece that was noted earlier in the talk today. Yeah, 
the more we don't do that, the more we, we see the space. And I just don't believe that we can fundamentally change the food system without operating at the policy level. So how we do that is up, you know, is up to people who think about that. I do think that, you know, I, I, I try to play the kind of mind experiment and think of what like, all the folks that were working in all these food justice projects throughout the country, if they got behind like kind of one kind of campaign, what could possibly happen? I, I think we'd see something pretty amazing. So, you know, I don't, you know, I'm, I am an academic. I mean, I, I used to be an organizer way back when. I, I kind of have had exposure to strategic thinking, but I think that there's no blueprint. I mean, sometimes it, it is, you know, sometimes it's doing lawsuits, and sometimes it's doing public protests, and sometimes it's, it, you know, it's doing um, what cause of ways that, that cause, you know, corporate embarrassment. I mean, I think there's all sorts of, uh, there's a menu of options that need to be explored. But I just think all of my message is, it's not enough to do it. Um, and I, I mean, obviously my work does not have direct, like, immediate policy implications, but, but I see it, you know, very connected to what they're talking about. And part of it is it's very informed by, um, by Bourdieu uh, and, and sort of his notions of thinking about the other sides, right? Thinking about um, something like breakfast as worthy of sociological inquiry, right? That's a, that's a relatively recent development. Um, and I think it's a powerful tool because it lets us think about, you know, in my angle of it, certainly these questions about meaning, about memory, about practice, right? What do you actually do every day um, when you wake up? What do you want to do every day? Um, and to me, that really, that fits with part of what you're talking about, about people inhabit communities, they inhabit spaces, they have practices that they engage in every day, and so whatever is going to, to happen, whether that's that sort of this clear-cutting change from the outside um, or efforts to change from the inside, those things happen at the nexus of the everyday, um, right? They happen at people's experiences of who they are um, and of where they are. And to me, part of that is about, um, you know, these sort of um, broader connections to our understanding of our own trajectory. Sort of where we come from and where we're going, we're going. And to me, food is one of the places where that happens. Um, not for everyone. You know, there are people who I, like, I use the phrase out of a memory, and they're just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's nothing to me. Um, I literally have, you know, people say that to me. And I have other people just not even allow me to finish the sentence because they're off and running, already explaining back to me the way in which I understand it out of a memory. So I get that that's not doesn't resonate with everyone, but again, I think it, I think it resides in the place where these things really happen in a daily way. I was interested in the panel to see that one of the things that seemed to emerge in this session was really interrogating the contradictions between urban and agricultural or farming practices. Certainly, you know, uh, Julie, you brought up the fact that anonymity and standardization are actually tools of liberation for a lot of people. They're tools of access to rights, to freedoms that otherwise are not accessible because of entrenched systems of inequality that latch on to our personal qualities, our race, our gender, our class. So anonymity and standardization is a very good thing. But then ironically, we also want to critique the standardization of large, top-down planning impositions. The farm that you showed, Jason, which was 10 square blocks, of the ideal integrated agriculture into Detroit. 10 blocks is a huge part of the city to isolate off. I and mean, if we think that highways destroy neighborhoods, think about taking 10 square blocks and separating neighborhoods with a farm. So there does seem to be a contradiction between the urban and the agricultural imperatives, politically, not just practically, but Jennifer, your work is really about how do we, how many ways have people lived with food mm -hmm. in cities over time? So it, it adds another dimension of the history and the histories that have been lost that maybe we could reclaim in more uh, uh, fruitful ways. So that was just one observation that I had about ways in which this panel sort of pushed us forward critically and theoretically, hopefully. <laughs> um, just in the last few minutes, are there any other questions? Any? Yes. I have a question. So I studied landscape art 
contemporary design in name, or is it really happening in practice? And so when I, you know, as a planner, you're taught a lot about public engagement, right? We use planning as an example here. But then when you see it often practice, what gets practiced is a tiny sliver of public engagement. It's we're going to send a note out about a, a public hearing that's going to happen. Hey, we're going to have a meeting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday in your neighborhood. If you look at the wider array of tools that are out there, and this is where I really push you, look at the different tools where we can really engage the community now. Um, I've seen some things with technology that amazes me. And we saw some of the earlier presentations on youth engagement. Um, it, the project in Central Valley that Emmanuel Pastor has worked on, um, where youth were taking cell phones and identifying the light in their community that they wanted eradicated. And it was eye-opening. Um, you learn things like, as Manuel talks about, the taco trucks were a huge problem. Not because of the taco trucks, but because all the truck drivers were parking there and idling the whole time. And the neighborhood really didn't like that. And that's the type of really deep intelligence that you need about a community to inform your design and to inform those best practices that you bring into that neighborhood. And I'd say just be creative. Be as creative in the ways that you engage that community as you are in the ways that you engage physical design. How do you build trust? When you come in at the Ohio State University, the Anchor Conferola, how do you build trust? That's a, a great question. The time, patience, and a willingness to sacrifice power. It, it all comes down to that. Um, trust is never handed over easily. And also having a willingness to acknowledge the wrongs of the past and acknowledge where. Um, you know, maybe my institution does have a bias and I need to be up front of it. Um, but it, it is an, it, it's a, a really sticky situation and in fact, as someone who works across the country, it's easier for me as a current institute to come into a community in another state than it is to come into a neighborhood in Columbus as the current institute, part of the Ohio State University. That identity brings trust issues with it. So, it's a great question. Well, what about the issue of time? Because it takes an investment of time. You have to keep going back. Okay, you have to go back. Yeah. You have to be willing to be hated and to listen. And so I think, I don't know any formula, but from a bit of reading up and the experience we've had, I find that the investment of time and the willingness to just be available, but to continue to show up all the time mm -hmm. out of the community celebrations, right. the parties, the festivals, yeah. and there. But I think that's one of the things that's very hard as we work with students in these processes. Some of the conversations we've had already this afternoon indicate that part of the issue is not just thinking about the community as that community, right? Thinking about the level of the city as, as a whole, thinking about the historical factors that shape experiences which may not have happened to that neighborhood, but really development, um, destruction of neighborhoods under occupation in Jennifer's cases, right? These things happen and are maintained in historical memory. And the only way to address them is through larger scale political and social action. And you, KB, obviously, you bring in the larger scale in your project in Wild Park, right? You're able to bring in the developers, and you're able to bring in uh, the Ohio State University. So you can both build trust locally, but you also can do things for the community with the agency that you bring institutionally. And I think, Carter, if you'd like to comment on that, Julia or Jen, about the, the larger scale uh, perspectives that we try to bring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be honest. No, I don't. <laughs>